Uh, I'm Salvador Cordova. Uh, one of my jobs is a uh, correspond being a correspondent at the National Institutes of Health uh, for my company, Millennium Analytics, and also the FMS Consortium Incorporated. Um, thankfully, this year I'm funded to do this sort of work, at least for a year. It's been exciting. Uh, there's always a, a mix of sadness when I think of uh, when I visit the NIH. Uh, one of our Dear colleagues Richard Sternberg uh, got fired from the NIH because of uh, his uh, affiliation with people like us. It caused a, a congressional investigation and also the office uh, of George Bush, the president, was also a special investigation. Sadly, nothing happened for Rick Sternberg. But that pointed me to the, the fact that there's exciting stuff happening at the NIH. So uh, I got recruited to try to, re to report on some of those developments, and I was glad to make um, report on some of those developments in my last talk. This will be a little bit outside of some of my NIH uh, reporting. Uh, so my presentation is on non-DNA heritable structures versus naturalism. To introduce the, the topic of my talk, um, I'll just review again uh, Herman Muller uh, and his famous or infamous limit. Muller won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1964. He studied radiation and mutation and effects of uh, these on human health. He realized uh, humanity will deteriorate genetically if there is, on average, one or more mutations per individual per generation. So there are naturalistic theories based on Muller's limit as a result. And one of those theories is that 98% of the human genome must be junk as a matter of principle. Otherwise, evolution is wrong, and probably naturalism is wrong. Um, the, the human genome has a measured mutation rate of 50 to 100 mutations per person per generation. It's presumed likely bad if the mutation happens in functional regions. So to reconcile 50 to 100 mutations per person with the Mueller limit, which is only one, one mutation per person, evolutionary biologists had to put a kludge, and that was just to postulate the genome is 98% junk, uh, which theoretically reduces the number of dam damaging mutations to within Mueller's limit. Um, numerous evolutionary biologists and theoretical evolutionary geneticists insist on this. It has nothing to do with empiricism. It's just ideology. Uh, what has happened is Mueller's limit is now in conflict with medical research. Uh, it's medical research, not creationists in particular, who are finding violations of Mueller's limit in their research. And this has created hostility between evolutionary biologists and medical researchers and molecular biologists. Uh, this current conflict was anticipated by Walter Remine in his book, Biotic Message. Just a humorous note. <laughs> Some. Uh, offers at Amazon to sell uh, copies of this book at $763.02. Um, this development uh, was also anticipated by John Sanford in 2004. Uh, Mueller's limit, or the mutational load argument, uh, it, it appears to me more significant than Haldane's dilemma because of its medical relevance. The nice thing also about Mueller's limit is it's fairly easy to understand. If we begin with a simplistic asexual haploid model, it's a surprisingly good approximation to much more uh, refined and realistic sexual diploid models that include Poisson distributions and other refinements which Mueller and others used. Uh, but I'll just show this to you with pictures. You'll see how easy it is to conceive. It's amazing uh, uh, so many people miss this. I do have to give credit to Walter uh, Remine and John Sanford for the following concept, uh, which I tried to animate. So if we begin with an asexually reproducing Eve here, she'll uh, generate children. And if we go by Mueller's limit and just put one mutation per child, see each child has one mutation. So then Eve goes away. And then natural selection will act on the fittest. So there are only three choices, and so we'll just presume natural selection allows this individual to live, the one in the remaining circle. And so rinse and repeat, the process goes on, 
and there are. Uh, this individual will now become the parent. He will have children that have his mutation, plus they'll have one more, because that's Mueller's limit of one mutation per individual per generation. So you'll see the genetic deterioration, even if natural selection is acting, and I'll simulate natural selection acting. So the parent goes away, and will pick the fittest of the three kids. And the fittest of the three kids is still worse off than the ancestor, Eve. Uh, rather than go through all the gory details, I will just kind of uh, fast forward to the third generation. There are three mutations now. The fourth generation has four mutations, and the fifth generation has five. Uh, I'm having a little problem with the coloring there. It's supposed to show uh, five. I'm, I apologize for that. And if this keeps going, you get Oh, there it is. There's the fifth mutation. If this keeps going, you get error catastrophe, just disaster. And this is uh, uh, the thing is, is that if we add all the refinement to include sexually reproducing uh, species and then all the various uh, things that geneticists would be interested in, it still arrives at basically the same result that you saw in that simplistic model. And, and by the way, uh, um, uh, that's one mutation per generation. Obviously, it would be worse if it were more mutations uh, per uh, human per generation. Now, importantly, there, uh, this, this leads to a scientifically testable hypothesis in creationists like John Sanford, uh, who's actually a world famous genetic engineer. It leads to a scientifically testable uh, testable claim, uh, we can actually, we can in principle determine if heritable diseases are increasing, which it does seem to be true. Um, we do have evidence that the bones of our ancestors were stronger, the brain size was bigger, and it, uh, the evidence is that we are getting sicker. Unfortunately, eugenicists have already been observing this, although eugenics isn't anything most creationists want to be associated with, but the genetic deterioration is uh, seems to be evident, and it's something that uh, um, this theory predicts, if the genome is supposed to be functional, by the way. And one thing we do know is reductive evolution, that is loss of function, is observationally shown to be a very dominant mode of evolution versus kind of the Darwinian fantasy of constructive or cumulative evolution. Uh, Eugene Kuhn in it, the National Institutes of Health actually reported on this. It's a very interesting paper. There, there's one other, uh, other implication of this that's usually avoided, and this is actually the reason I think most of the genome is functional. If Mueller, Mueller's limit is uh, obeyed, and if it's right, it would imply only 2% of the human genome is functional. And if we do some conversion factors with the gigabase pairs and the Shannon bits, and then take only 2% of that, we end up with the functionality uh, of chemical states uh, using uh, Shannon's conversion. It, it would only equate to 15.7 megabytes. And so I asked the rhetorical question, can 15.7 megabytes implement a human mind? Uh, and we have to think, can even 810 megabytes, uh, which would be 100% functionality of the genome, could that implement a human mind, and, and given that we have so many devices out there that don't seem as complex as a human but use much more storage space, uh, it, it does stretch um, some uh, credulity. It, it, it inspires some skepticism. So uh, I, I covered the junk DNA issue in the, in the last talk, but that's only the problem. Uh, ENCODE was the, the pioneer uh, of saying that most of the genome is functional, but that's actually the sentiment you'll get for most medical researchers, and uh, that inspired the, the counterattacks by the evolutionists who said, if ENCODE is right, evolution is wrong. Um, um, uh, I, I should point out, most evolutionists assume the genome is, is at least at least 5 to 15 percent functional because, because of accepted molecular biology, but they don't have any I've never seen any of them give good answers for why this violation of Mueller, Mueller's limit isn't acknowledged. So uh, 
uh, already they're admitting something is, is amiss. So I will uh, today argue that en ENCODE may understate the challenge to evolutionary theory because uh, ENCODE is only DNA-centric, even epigenetically speaking. So I'll review some evidence of non-DNA inheritance, some of the theory of non-DNA inheritance, and I'll try to explain how the central dogma doesn't preclude non-DNA in inheritance, contrary to what many may think. So the central dogma of molecular biology there's a lot of argument over definition. I'm not going to be too particular about which definition I use. Uh, one that's kind of colloquial, it's uh, DNA makes RNA makes protein. That's true. But uh, I'll amend that a little bit to say DNA is a template for RNA, which is a template for proteins, not the other way around. Um, and also the, the present day DNA is also a template for future DNA. So there are the central dogma, I think, is mostly correct, even though there are a few very notable exceptions. Uh, the consequences of this is that some mistakenly assume the central dogma requires inheritance must be purely based on DNA, and that's not correct. To understand why, we'll have to review some basics of biochemistry. There are four major classes of molecules in biology, amino acids, nucleic acids, the DNAs and RNAs, lipids, which are fats, sterols, et cetera, and sugars, the erudite word for that is carbohydrates. So sugars are, are not only uh, just for sources of energy. Sugars are readable, writable information carriers, uh, uh, not just sources of energy. Uh, the information role of sugars is mostly ignored because of the difficulty of sequencing uh, of sugars compared to the sequencing of nu nucleic acids. And this leads me to the proverb of lost keys. It, it does relate to this DNA centrism. A police officer uh, encounters a man near a street light. He says he's looking for his lost keys. The officer asks, did you lose your keys around here? And the man responds, no, I lost them a block away, but I'm looking for them here because the light is better near the street light. And that is part of the problem with the DNA centricity that's going around. Now, I, I'm not trying to say that there's a conspiracy theory. There are there are very understandable reasons why non-DNA inheritance might be ignored. DNA is a single point of failure change. It's easily noticeable many times when one part of DNA in, in a critical part is mutated, catastrophe can happen. It's very easy to see the heritable effects. In contrast, a lot of non-DNA inheritance is multi-point failure change. Um, it's redundancy on the order of thousands. So if you damage an information storage device of non-DNA inheritance, you may not notice it. You have to change many things simultaneously to affect new heritable features. Uh, so it's easy to uh, presume there's no heritable contribution from these other mechanisms of inheritance. I'll give an example. Delete 90% of the mit mitochondrial organelle, not just the DNA, mitochondrial DNA, but the entire mitochondrial, mitochondrial organelle in a cell. The mitochondria will re reproduce um, you only notice that it's bad when you delete all the mitochondria. So that's what I was saying about thousands of levels of redundancy. And if you wanted to change how the actual mitochondrial uh, structure is, you'd have to change all the mitochondria si simultaneously. And uh, incidentally, that's why heteroplasmy in uh, mitochondria is rare. In contrast, you really, in general, you can't delete 90% of DNA without killing the organism. So that's one of, that, that, to me, that's the main reason non-DNA inheritance is ignored. It's not yet medically relevant, some of this other class of uh, inheritance that I'll talk about, uh, which is in contrast to ENCODE, where it, it, it really is relevant right now. And also, there's insufficient sequencing technologies to break the sugar information codes. So I mentioned sugars. Uh, they are ignored. It's, very, it's not because of uh, willful ignorance. It's just very difficult to sequence this. So this diagram comes from the textbook that is forced upon me at the NIH. It's a biochemistry uh, diagram. The pink line here is a protein. And this pink line is also a protein. These little squiggly lines are fats, or lipids. Sorry, lipids. Uh, this is a depiction of um, 
Uh, this area here is the membrane of the cell. That's the outside of the cell. That's toward the inside of the cell. So now you'll notice all these things like the N-glycan, the O-glycan, and these other little decorations. Those are polysaccharides. They're sugars. This chondroitin sulfates the sugar. This heparin sulfates the sugar. And you'll notice that they have all these little decorations. Well, those are information-bearing positions. Each of those positions is information-bearing. And something that should be notable is that it's not just linear, linearly laid out. In the case of heparin sulfate, the sugar is laid out. All the little, um, all, uh, all the little monosaccharides, the little sugars there, these little decorations are laid out in a line. But they can also be laid out in these other geometries. And that's actually significant because you could store information based on the, on the three-dimensional conformation. So it actually makes it more um, capable as an information storage device than DNA. In fact, uh, from that same textbook, I'll just make some quotes. Um, in addition to their important roles as fuels, sugars such as polysaccharides and oligosaccharides are information carriers. On almost every eukaryotic cell, specific oligosaccharide uh, uh, chains attach to components of the plasma membrane to form a carbohydrate layer, the glycocalyx, several nanometers thick that serves as an important information-rich surface. And again, I, I point you to this diagram. And I should point out, in the more complex creatures like humans, half of, half of our proteins have glycoconjugates attached to them. That means the proteins are actually big information carriers. Now, the central dogma can be true but simultaneously bypassed. That's my suggestion. I, I know some people might have differing opinions. So I'll argue there's really no strain, need to strain at criticizing or trying to falsify the central dogma. dogma. Assume for the sake of argument it is true. And as I mentioned, glycans are polysaccharide sugars. So, and uh, the analog of the genome with DNA is the glycome with sugars. So we have the genome with DNA, we have the glycome with sugars. The glycome implements what's called, what they call the sugar code, and it partly bypasses the central dogma. By the way, no one has cracked what the sugar code is. <laughs> it could be multiple codes for all that we know. Um, this is well acknowledged in literature. There is no uh, template from DNA to the glycome. So you, you can have a template from DNA to RNA to protein. That's called translation. We can also template DNA. DNA to DNA, that's called replication. However, we don't have DNA, RNA, protein to sugar. So not. That doesn't happen. Uh, it's, it's, right now, it's ill-defined how, how the information gets to the sugar. Uh, uh, it's non-trivial. It involves sugars, RNAs, DNAs, protein, lipid, environment, whatever. And that's how you come up with the information content on the sugar. So I'll give a little diagram here of how uh, inheritance, kind of my conception of inheritance. We have here how the DNA replicates in generation one several times all the way to generation n and then generation n plus one. So this is just copying with a little mutation. And so we could see that the, the mechanism of inheritance for DNA to the next generation is DNA. That's not so hard. Then also the mechanism of inheritance for the sequences in RNA and the sequences in protein uh, can be driven by the DNA too. And so in the, uh, when there's mutation in the DNA in, uh, in that generation, uh, we will change the, we'll have corresponding changes in the RNA and in the protein. So so far, so good. But what's really interesting, you can see here I, I have this square on sugar generation N. Sugar generation N, uh, the state of those sugars are based on the uh, sugar in prior generations. And it's uh, influenced by the environment plus the DNA. So there's no direct template. So what this means is now there is a, there's a parallel pathway of inheritance. You have the inheritance through the DNA and the inheritance through the sugars. And this is 
one thing I'll point out, for the ones who are really uh, very DNA-centric, well, they'll say, well, see, DNA still made the sugar somehow. Well, I'll say, well, there's still a problem here because the state of the sugars in this generation N could arguably be influenced by the DNA in generation one that no longer exists in that original form. And that problem will just be there. So effectively, we do have a separate uh, line of heritable information that's being transmitted that's outside of the DNA. And this would also be true for other mechanisms of inheritance. So revisiting uh, this diagram, I hope it's a little bit more meaningful now. So um, I have to credit Arthur Jones. He's a creationist, excellent biologist, Jonathan Wells, Don Johnson, and others. And uh, it's just worth reading Meyer's um, comment in his book, Darwin's Doubt. Biologists know of an additional source of epigenetic information stored in the arrangement of sugar molecules on the exterior surface of the cell membrane. Sugars can be attached to the lipid molecules that make up the membrane itself, in which case they are called glycolipids, or they can be attached to the proteins embedded in the membrane, in which case they are called glycoproteins. Since simple sugars can be combined in many more ways than amino acids, which make up proteins, the resulting cell surface patterns can, enormous, can be enormously complex. As Ronald Schnarr, uh, Schnarr explains, each sugar building block can assume several different positions. It is as if an A could serve as four different letters, depending on whether it was standing upright, turned upside down, or laid on either of its sides. In fact, seven simple sugars can be rearranged to form hundreds of thousands of unique words, most of which have no more than five letters. The sequence-specific information-rich structures influence the arrangement of different cell types during embryological development. Thus, some cell biologists now refer to the arrangements of sugar molecules as the sugar code and compare these sequences to the digitally encoded information stored in DNA. As biochemist Hans Joachim Gabius notes, sugars provide a system with high-density coding that is essential to allow cells to communicate efficiently and swiftly through complex surface interactions. According to Gabius, these sugar molecules surpass amino acids and nucleotides by far in information storing capacity. So the precisely arranged sugar molecules on the surface of cells clearly represent another source of information independent of that stored in DNA-based sequences. Now, um, there are other evidences of uh, non-DNA inheritance. This is one I got at the NIH. Uh, actually, I got it from Michael Behe's mentor there, uh, Gary Felsenfeld, who actually <laughs> really resents Michael Behe being his pupil because he, he doesn't like uh, intelligent design. Anyway, Gary Felsenfeld, in, in uh, the textbook on epigenetics that was uh, being taught at the NIH, he pointed out this creature called a, a paramecium. The paramecium has these little cilia right here. And I'll just quote a section from him. I'll start here uh, where it says, right there, I'll start there. A second kind of epigenetic transmission was clearly shown in paramecia and other ciliates in which the ciliary patterns may vary among individuals and are inherited clonally. Altering the cortical pattern by microsurgery results in transmission of a new pattern to succeeding generations. So I'll just stop there. Um, there are in vitro experiments on organelle inheritance that show uh, 3D pho photocopying. So I'll start with the uh, kind of the proverbial concept of the putting a frog in a blender or the Humpty Dumpty problem. You could throw them in a blender, run the blender, not a very nice thing to do, but you'll have pretty much all the right proportion of the proteins and RNAs and DNAs, but the thing won't live. Um, you can have a blended mix of, uh, of, of proteins, not just from one organism, but several. Now, in a few rare instances, if you put an organelle in the blended soup of proteins, some from even different organisms, sometimes the organelles reproduce, where the organelle as acts as a structural seed. So there are more and more experiments of this variety being carried out. If you Google organelle inheritance, you'll start to see some of this. Uh, for myself, I said, gee, these are kind of interesting. Do you, do you think we, do you think some of us could do some experiments like this on our own? Be kind of interesting. I'm thinking 
be cool to transplant chloroplasts or um, try to put them in uh, animals. Anyway, uh, what's the extent of these in vitro experiments? We have been able to, uh, experimenters, uh, I'll list some of the things that they've been able to uh, grow in vitro uh, without DNA. Uh, they've been able to duplicate uh, the Golgi apparatus, paraxomes, I think some of the microtubules, the centri centrioles, uh, centrosome matrix, the mitochondria indefinitely, uh, the lysosome, and the endoplasmic rectilium. So you can see that's a large fraction of the cell. Um, Non-DNA inheritance, by the way, might falsify certain evolutionary claims. Uh, naturalism and neo-Darwinism. Neo-Darwinism is very DNA-centric. Uh, evolutionists want simplistic descriptions of biology. Complexity is anathema to their theories. Um, Non-DNA inheritance may imply a, a fundamental immutability of form and preclude mac macroevolution as a, as a matter of principle. And biology is shown even more complex than ENCODE suggests. I should point out uh, the in insufficiency of DNA by itself and the near sufficiency of the cytoplasm by itself to replicate. DNA by itself is an insufficient quine or uh, self-replicating program program or a von Neumann automata. In contrast, cells missing DNA are almost sufficient self-replicators. For example, if uh, enucleated zygotes, that zygotes without DNA, can duplicate up to the blastula stage because of the front-loaded mRNA in the egg. To me, that is proof the cytoplasm is more information rich than DNA in terms of inheritance. Um, cytoplasm is very important. Turtles' gender is determined not by genes, but by temperature. Male and female turtles have this identical genomes. So the cytoplasm is what makes meaning for DNA. Um, and, and, and different cell types, the cytoplasm in different cell types interpret DNA differently. Um, it's called combinatorial gene regulation. Uh, Robert John of uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute has some excellent YouTubes on that. So um, I've suggested that the, the cytoplasm is where uh, it exists a template for things like the origami code, the histone code, the sugar code, and other codes. Uh, and I'll cover what the origami code is shortly. So there's, this is this origami code. There are multiple meanings of DNA dependent on the cell type. So this diagram here is uh, I believe, yeah, if it, it's, a, uh, it's regarding a mouse. So this mouse uh, beta globin locus and erythroid progenitor cells, you can see the conformation of the DNA, the looping here, is different when then it becomes a definitive erythroid cell. The loops change. The loops change. And that looping affects gene expression. Uh, so I, I think the multiple meanings of DNA um, indicate that DNA is not the sole determinant of heredity. Uh, DNA can't, can't uh, give meaning to itself. Um, and also the non-coding regulatory DNA is context dependent. And, and what happens is inside the, the nucleus, the cell nucleus, the these looping conformations that focus the transcription, it's different depending on the cell type. So there's some sort of, that's the origami code. There's, there's some sort of code that changes these conformations. You can actually identify the cell type based on these looping conformations. And that's some very exciting work being done at the NIH. Uh, um, right now it's being spearheaded by this uh, project called the 4D nucleome, 4D nucleome. So in conclusion, biological complexity has blasted beyond Mueller's limit of 15.7 megabytes of sustainable Shannon information. Non-DNA heritable information perhaps thousands of times beyond the complexity defined by Mueller's limit. And, uh, naturalism was unhelpful, maybe even harmful to the, to the discovery of such biological complexity. And to me, this says there, there needs to be an alternative to naturalism which we, the name of this conference, AMNAT, 
and some acknowledgments. I'd like to acknowledge the Blythe Institute, the Evolution Informatics Lab, and several unnamed parties. I'd like to acknowledge my friends Carolyn Crocker and James Coppage and the rest of the Expelled Gang who have inspired me to carry on in proclaiming suppressed truths. Uh, the story of Carolyn Crocker is very sad. We uh, appeared in the journal Nature 2005 telling our stories and three weeks later she was fired from, from George Mason University. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with James, Cop James Coppage and uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk Richard Sternberg. So I would like to salute these uh, these brave individuals for what they've done to uh, help advance the truth. Thank you very much. And I'll unmute uh, this discussion for everyone to ask questions. Thank you. Yeah, so to what extent um, is, are, is the, like the figure-based inheritance um, and the other types uh, influenced by the, uh, the tissue type? Like there's a lot of stuff in DNA that's, that's tissue specific. But there, it doesn't seem like there's been a lot of research that tells what sort of things are are activated by different by different tissue types. Hmm. And I didn't know if there's some relation here. Tissue types can influence um, splicing, uh, which genes are expressed, how the DNA is looped. All of those things, um, a lot of it under the control of, of um, what we'd call non-coding DNA. So, um, yeah, a lot of uh, there, there are an awful lot of signals that are affected by tissue type, and we don't know much at all about how that gets controlled. Um, what do you know about uh, where the Glycoproteins and glycolipids are modified. Where they get their, their sugars attached. So, so the question was, uh, where do the uh, where do these uh, glycolipids and glycoproteins uh, get modified? And we're only beginning to understand where we've only the first part of that is where are these uh, the glycans synthesized that end up being conjugated, and we're only like in the last year, we're only beginning to just scratch the surface of the synthesis pathway. We haven't even quite figured that out. And also, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have that much information on on how the other parts are modified. I will point this out why there, there should be hope this is going to be investigated. Uh, I'm a very numbers financial oriented type person, and I see that um, some of the projections I see are $22 billion uh, being invested in glycobiology in, in the not too distant future. The, the reason for that is not trying to prove function of DNA. The pharmaceutical companies are extremely important, uh, interested in this because a lot of their therapeutic, uh, the therapeutic drug market, they're trying to get to understand the information processing on the cell membrane. And that means mod reading and modifying the, uh, the sugars there. So, um, it's also entirely possible there's some pharmaceutical companies that know a better picture of this, but they're not releasing what they know. So uh, I'm really sorry I can't give you a better answer than that. Uh, my goal was to just try to introduce people who may not be familiar with the sugar code, uh, with the sugar code. So you probably know more than I do. I think it's back on about slide 62 or 63. Um, you listed some things, and one of them I can't remember your exact words, but it said something about, uh, oh, oh, not quite that far back, something about how this non-DNA uh, non heritability could cast into doubt the mutability of organisms or species or something. I forget yes. where that was. Where right here. Right here. Uh, let me see. Right here. The, the reason for that is um, when you damage the cytoplasm, it recovers. It heals itself. There's so much self-healing in the cytoplasm. We know that in developmental biology. There are all sorts of, um, there's all, all sorts of injuries you could throw at the embryo, and it recovers. You can't do that with, D I mean, there is DNA repair. 
Uh, part of it's just natural to, you know, uh, to repair double strands. But the level of injury that the cytoplasm can take and still huh. find a way to heal itself, it can self-heal. And that's one reason we just think it's heritable stuff there because we're just blowing huge sections of it. Um, they had tried, They I don't know how they did it, they remo managed to remove all the Golgi apparatus in one cell. I don't know which one it was. And it finally shut down the duplication of the Golgi from uh, organelle inheritance. It had to invoke a, a secondary pathway, which is actually very interesting because it shows that the secondary pathway anticipated the primary pathway. The uh. primary pathway is three-dimensional copying. It's very easy to do 3D copying like a Xerox machine. It's very hard to do it from a coded standpoint. And so they found two independent ways to construct the same organism, I mean organelle, in the biological system. So how did the backup system work? How did it know how to construct the primary copy? They had, you had to have two separate evolutionary pathways to achieve that. Not to mention knocking out, um, say, uh, a thousand organelles in a cell or changing them all simultaneously is really difficult. But that's that's the level of redundancy that's in that part of the cytoplasm. Wow. The cytoplasm has deep redundancy. You could you could wipe stuff out and it heals itself. It's just beautiful. And that's why people think you know, people it's it reminds me of the space shuttle. It has five redundancies for its navigation system. You can knock out four of them and it the space shuttle flies like it had all five still. You don't notice the difference. There's no, there's no change, uh, noticeable change uh, in immediate function. It's like uh, throwing out a spare tire of a car. It's like, well, it still drives fine, so that was junk. And <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's the issue with the deep redundancy. All of this is being inherited, and we're not noticing it. And I think that's the major reason it's been ignored. It's not because there's some conspiracy, but yeah. uh, DNA is so easy to point to because it's a single point of failure in many cases. That's amazing. So, so I don't, the reason I think this will block macroevolution is like, well, how do you change so many parts at the same time? So that means if a plant uh, falls to another class of plant, you've got to simultaneously change all the chloroplasts. Yeah. How do you over, how do you overcome all the redundancies is what you're saying. So exactly. Thousands, thousands of levels, huh. thousands. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Mm, Sal, quick question. Yes. Have oh, you, yes. are you familiar with the work of Eric Davidson from Caltech? Uh, only, a, only a passing because I hear it. Kind of amazing. By, uh, absolutely amazing. <laughs> I, I, I hear that a lot uh, from Paul Nelson, so that's about my only exposure. You have heard the name before, what you call basically the origami code. Uh, this is all, he's really the Pope, unfortunately he died recently, but he's the one behind all of these uh, assist regulatory modules and the gene regulatory networks. Um, I'll, I'll give you the name. Uh, explains a lot of things. It explains how the different cell types arise and how the same DNA can have many, many functions. So it's an important name to know. Yes, I, I will look it up. Yeah. Uh, the exciting thing is uh, money is now being thrown at the research. It's now being thrown at the uh, at the question of the origami code. So. This is all coming, I mean, this, this is stuff that's just coming out in, like, the last few months. Some of the stuff I'm just talking about. It's just mm -hmm. so new. I can't keep track of it all. Maybe one more comment, though. Yes, please. Um, even, even if a sizable portion of DNA uh, was, was junk, it doesn't mean that mutations would be harmless. That's also a, a, a bad reasoning. Um, we, we know, for example, that special patterns that are used as recognizing sites, for example, the uh, uh, cis patterns, that they're not found elsewhere in DNA because it would tie up your transcription factors. So mutations, even in so-called innocent DNA, 
could end up doing all kinds of stuff it shouldn't be doing. Yes, and I have, I have some examples of that. I should mention one reason that medical researchers think the genome is mostly functional is 90% of single nucleotide polymorphisms associated mm -hmm. with heritable disease or cancers or whatever, it's in the non-coding regions. Yeah. So just extrapolating that, it means the non-coding regions is, is as important as the coding regions. Oh, yeah. Now, it's also hard, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of uh, redundancy in the DNA. Um, I mentioned the dystrophin gene earlier. It has up, up to 100 repeats uh, that's called D4Z4. It's like a 33 kilobase pair repeat. It's repeated 100 times. When the number of repeats is reduced below 11, the uh, individual gets muscular dystrophy. So uh, there's a lot of things. It's very hard to judge when a section of DNA is not, uh, is not functional because it can tolerate some change. And, um, you know, a lot of people just think because the repetitive sequences, they, you know, these tandem repeats, they must be junk. Um, it usually turns out not to be.